Let's get started. It's about five minutes after. Before we get underway, I want to say that uh, I have some bad news and some good news. So the Cowboys are playing tonight. <laughs> the good news is, don't expect much, y'all. I love my Cowboys, but, you know, Tampa Bay. All right, enough said. So. All right, well, let's get started. All right, well, everybody, welcome to the District 2 Town Hall. This is our second uh, meeting that we're having, and we're going to discuss uh, some topics that I think you will find very interesting. So I'm fortunate to represent District 2 as their council member uh, in my third term. And again, when I say that I consider myself fortunate, I do mean it, because in service, in public service, you do find a lot of satisfaction in being able to help your fellow neighbors. So to date, we've been through a lot, you know, this past year plus, haven't we? The pandemic that won't leave us alone, the winter apocalypse, whatever you want to call it. You know, we weather these storms in the best Fort Worth fashion. And I think that our first responders, you know, police department, fire department, our city staff, you know, really showed what they're made of and how they responded to that. So I'm not one to quickly forget, but it really illustrated for us the importance of delivering city services in a very efficient manner and sometimes under duress. So it's related to what we're going to talk about here because it does take money, it does take revenue to afford these city services, to be able to deliver them in the manner that, you know, residents expect. And so what we're going to talk about tonight uh, pertains to the upcoming 2022 bond program, $1.28 billion, I think it is. So that's, that's a pretty large undertaking, but we are the 12th largest city in the nation, and our needs are only increasing. We're also going to talk about the fiscal year 22 uh, budget, and again, that city budget is closely tied to how we allocate these monies, these funds, to make our city run. Transportation Public Works, we have several members of that department here. Thank you for being here. They're going to talk to us specifically about projects citywide and specifically to District 2. We have our police department well represented here tonight. Thank you all for being here. And they're going to talk about initiatives like Safe City and also the CCPD. And we're going to have some information also available for redistricting because that's coming up. As I said before, our city is growing. We're going to grow by two council seats. And with that upcoming change, it's very important that our residents know that they can take part too. You can take part in our redistricting process. So at the end of each presentation, you'll have an opportunity to comment, to ask questions of the presenters. Uh, David Cook, thank you, our city manager just walked in. Appreciate you being here, sir. And so I ask just for the sake of time that you hold off on your questions at the end of the presentations, and we'll be happy to answer them. And uh, once we, uh, you know, have the subject matter explained, you may, you know, find yourself uh, wanting additional information that perhaps we'll have to get back to you on. That's perfectly fine. You can approach me or an individual staff member if it's specific to something that they presented, and we'd be happy to help you with that. So our city's been running pretty well, and that's a credit to our city manager and to your city council. We made some good financial decisions that helped us, as I said before, weather the pandemic, because what did the pandemic do? It affected our city revenues. We expected them to be lower than they actually were, and that's a pleasant surprise. Fort Worth is rising up again. You know, our small business community is starting to firm up. And our revenues, again, have, you know, bested projections. So that's good news for you, and it's a testament to how we very carefully manage and spend your public dollars. So without further ado, I think I'm going to call on Joel McAhaney to start us off. And Joel, I think you'll start off with the uh, 2022 bond program. Is that correct? That's correct. All right, Joel. The podium's yours. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, I'm Joel McElhaney. I'm the Capital Program Manager for the Park and Recreation Department. And tonight, I'm giving an overview of the 2022 Bond Program, review the goals that helped guide that program, uh, review the process for selecting projects that made the final recommendation to the City Council, 
and we'll quickly review those projects and then just a highlight of the next steps. Let's see here. There it is. Uh, so the goals that guided this program uh, are to maintain and improve our existing infrastructure and address equity, provide mobility and city services in those high growth areas, enhance active transportation and recreation corridors, allow for flexibility and partnerships through leverage opportunities, then we want to achieve balance and be good stewards of the public taxpayer's dollar. A couple highlights of this program. 29.8 million has been allocated for quick start of capital projects. So a bond program typically has five-year implementation window. We have five years to build out the, pro the projects in that program. So it helps to get a quick start on those projects, and that means getting the engineer or designer on board early, getting right away, acquiring it where we need to, and relocating utilities if needed. Most of this is for our arterial projects and also the Forest Park Pool project. We're able to get the design started early. Second is to reserve debt capacity. So th this bond program is 500 million. The city's debt capacity is actually greater than that amount, but we want to reserve some of that de debt capacity for unforeseens. These would be opportunities for grants or other leverage opportunities, partnerships with other agencies and also uh, emergencies. There might be repairs or replacement that's required, just those unforeseen type capital improvements. So we reserve debt capacity to accomplish those things. Then some of the highlights of this 2022 program, uh, 213 million is identified for leveraging with other organizations. So Tarrant County or Texas Parks and Wildlife, other organizations where we're putting our local dollars with theirs in order to achieve a common goal in a capital project. 230 million of the, of the value of this program is in majority minority areas, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that later in some upcoming slides. And over $100 million is for park improvements and open space conservation. This slide is gonna be covered by Lorraine in our next presentation. Um, she's gonna give a budget presentation and she's gonna cover this very thoroughly. So I'll just go into what makes a project uh, considered for this bond program. There's a lot of inputs, and we try to represent them here in this slide. So when uh, we have master plans, departmental master plans, it could be the, like in my department, we have the park recreation open space master plan, our transportation folks have a master thoroughfare plan. So we have plans that guide our capital improvements. So we, we look for projects that are identified in a plan, we also get public input, and that can come from the city council, it can come from boards and commissions, it can come from the public directly through public meetings or neighborhood meetings, that sort of thing. And also we look at areas of growth, uh, areas of growth that may demand services, maybe a need for libraries, parks, road improvements in those areas of growth, so we look at that as well. The process for vetting the, all the recommended projects it, it, to get to uh, where we are today, it really kind of goes through a filter here. First, this, this actually kicked off back in October of 2019. All city departments made their recommendations for projects to be included in the 2022 bond program. So uh, this, this included parks, police, transportation, public works, code compliance, police, or police I already mentioned fire, um, and libraries neighborhood services, all these departments came in with their list, list of projects, myself included, representing the Park and Recreation Department. And then the city a committee uh, developed a list of prioritization criteria, and I'm gonna go through those in the next slide. And the projects were prioritized based on that criteria and then presented to the city manager through multiple meetings. We got input from the city manager's office, took that input into account, vetted the list, presented that to city council. We got input from city council. And then we're here today at a series of public meetings that actually kicked off back in July. We had those citywide open house meetings. We got input there and that rolled into district town hall meetings that we're at today. And uh, we'll get the public input. So the criteria used to prioritize these projects are listed on this slide. Equity, that's a new criterion, and I'm gonna cover that next. But service deficiencies, that's where we have gaps in service. 
leverage opportunities where we can leverage our local dollars with other agencies or grants and partnerships in order to build out a common goal. Approved master plans, is this project in a city council approved master plan or is it in line with our city strategic goals? Capital replacement of aging facilities, project collaboration between departments, improving existing infrastructure, we ask if this project is required, is it triggered because of a federal, state, or legal requirement? Is it addressing public health or safety issue? And last, will this capital improvement project trigger or stimulate economic development? So this new criterion, equity, came out of the recommendations of the Fort Worth Task Force for Race and Culture. And we, in order to identify this and use this as a criterion, we identified what are super majority minority areas, and those are in blue, and that's defined as 75% minority population or greater. Majority minority areas, shown here in green, are 50% minority population or greater. So we looked at all the projects that were recommended throughout the city, and then we gave weight to projects that were in these areas. So back in October 2019, as I mentioned, that's when this whole thing kicked off. All city departments showed up with their, their list of projects, and it was a total of 1.28, almost $1.3 billion. When I read this slide, sometimes I misspeak and I say million. I gotta remind myself, that's a B, 1.3 billion. So the, over half those projects, 53%, were street mobility. We had facilities, that includes police, fire stations, libraries, community centers at 28% or 364 million. Parks walked in there with a list of $260 million. And then we had open space and conservation at $30 million. Again, that was the initial list back in October of 2019. Then we put the projects through that prioritization criteria and the, the top priority projects moved into our current recommendation of a $500 million bond program, and that's broke out by project type in this pie chart. 64% of the projects address uh, mobility, uh, streets, roads. 17% or 87 million are park and recreation improvements. 29 million, almost 30 million, 6% of the program is community center facilities, that's two community centers. Fire, sta fire safety has two fire stations recommended in this program. Police department has a new uh, police precinct facility. And co open space conservation is identified at 15 million, or 3% of the bond program. It's a $500 million program. And now I'll review the projects. I'm gonna go through these kind of quickly, and I think uh, a few of you are here, you may wanna grab the list. It's available on the table. It has all these projects listed in there in, the, in a spreadsheet format. So streets and pedestrian mobility, our projects are highlighted here. The council districts are shown behind them. Now there's same, same projects shown with the MMA and SMMA areas highlighted. Those street mobility projects are listed by project type here. And one of the highlights of this slide is how we're leveraging our local funding with other agencies. And, that, and to highlight that, I'm just going to show across the top here arterials, the very top line. There's recommended amount of $110 million in 2022 bond funds, but we've, we've requested Tarrant County participation in the amount of $149 million. We've also added to that, but that amount 49 million in impact fees, traffic impact fees, and other funds for a total project cost of 308 million. Now, this is dependent on the Tarrant County's successful bond program and their approval of the partnership on these projects. If we're successful with that, that's a total 308 million at a bond fund amount of 110 million. If we go to the bottom line here of this, 570 million over in the bottom right corner, uh, $570 million worth of improvements at a bond fund amount of 320 million. So the power of leveraging and partnering. Those arterials are listed here as 11. There's projects that support transit, three listed here, East Lancaster, 
And the second two, Eastbury and McCart Avenue, are for uh, design only, but that's to get us in a position where we're shovel ready on projects for future funding opportunities where we can go ahead and move into construction quickly. The proposed intersections listed here are 12. Um, wanted to mention the top one on there, Council District 2. It's not too far from where we're at tonight. Um, it is the Jacksboro Highway and that Northside Drive or University Drive intersection. So this would, uh, the, the actual design would be determined when an engineer is hired and we're actually in the design process. Expect it to be reconfiguration of the geometry of the intersection, perhaps uh, signal improvements as well. $5 million is identified for addressing corridors, transportation corridors that have a high fatality or injury rate. This is part of the Vision Zero program where the goal is zero fatalities in these transportation corridors. And those are listed here, there's 10 of them. That's a total of eight and a half miles. And it also represents 116 crashes per mile. It's the importance of addressing these corridors. I think over half my audience just left here, so uh, I uh, come back. No, it didn't bother me at all. Um, <laughs> and I was just getting to the fun stuff with park and recreation. So park and recreation project shown here on this map with the, with the council districts highlighted behind it. Uh, again, we're showing these projects, distribution of these projects with the MMA and SMMA highlighted. I'll just mention here, 55% of these projects 47 million are in an SMMA or MMA. Projects are listed here. Again, that's a total of 87 million. We do have some leveraging on these projects as well, highlighted in red, Heritage and Paddock Parks. There's uh, private funding and North Central Texas Council of Government's participation and also the county as, and, as well. So good partnership there. So the botanic garden infrastructure improvements, uh, the, uh, there's been deferred maintenance. The management has been um, handed over to the Botanic Research Institute of Texas. And there, as part of that agreement, that management agreement, we are uh, addressing some of the deferred maintenance at the, at the facilities there. So this 4.6 million goes toward that effort. 13 and a half million for Heritage and Paddock Park. I mentioned that's a, that's a bigger project. That's a $28 million project. There's private foundations contributing. I mentioned COG and, and the county as well. So a lot of, lot of people involved in that project to improve both Heritage and Paddock Park. And then the last one on the list here, Water Gardens, is improvements at, of the existing infrastructure out there. We have failing pipes and pumps system, electrical system, lighting, paving that needs to be replaced in the amount of six and a half million. We have 11 or 13 sites on here, drainage and erosion control projects uh, located throughout the city. Meadowbrook Golf Course. So this is a great new building where we're at, Rockwood Clubhouse. But in 2014 bond program, $2 million was included to renovate the greens. Now we also added additional funding, city funding to that, and we also had some Tarrant Regional Water District involvement. It's a $5 million project to redo all the greens out here is completed in 2016. We want to do the same thing at Meadowbrook. So this is a full reconfiguration of tees, fairways, greens, irrigation, golf court paths. So it's um, a full renovation of the course. Sycamore Park, some of you may recall that Sycamore Creek Golf Course was closed in October of 2019, and that property is repurposed as a community park. So following that closure, we had a, a series of public meetings, got input on what people want to see there in that community park, and this funding would go toward building out that master plan. The stop, oh, we have two aquatics facilities in the recommended in the bond program. The first, East Fort Worth and Stop 6 neighborhood would be part or built adjacent to the Stop 6 hub. And the second is the replacement of Forest Park Pool. And this is a replacement of the existing facility. Both of these facilities would be enhanced neighborhood family aquatic centers, It'd be a similar type pool at both Stop 6 and Forest Park. The Echo Lake improvements, uh, two community parks here, Echo Lake, we do a master plan and park development at Echo Lake, and second one, Gateway Park in East Fort Worth. 
the uh, master plan was adopted by city council back in 2009, but there's been a lot of change in recreational opportunities since then. So our recommendation is to relook at that master plan, do an update to the master plan, and build out the recommended improvements. Neighborhood parks, uh, one of which is in uh, in Council District 2, Lebo Park, was acquired in 2019. It's a nine and a half acre park. So the, the funding identified for that would be for master planning the park and building out those park improvements. Fort Worth Zoo, the city has an obligation to fund utilities when the zoo funds the uh, the improvements, the, uh, the new exhibits or new facilities that they're building, that's at the Fort Worth Zoological's expense. Those improvements are then deeded over to the city. And, but our cost, our obligation is to fund the utilities. So this might be utility service to those new facility or it might be relocating utilities that are in the way of that new facility. So three and a half million identified for that effort. Whoops, I skipped trail gap connections. Three trail gaps throughout the city be addressed with this five and a half million, and our intent again is to leverage this funding with partnerships. We already have a $4.9 million grant from the North Central Texas Council of Governments. That's actually federal funding that's channeled through the COG to this project. So we're, able, we're gonna be able to leverage that local funding for that bigger grant. And uh, Mistletoe Bridge, the Forest Park, and Sycamore Creek in East Fort Worth as well. Two other projects there. Open space conservation is something new. The Park and Recreation Department acquires parkland. Uh, we acquire parkland almost every year. There's uh, parkland acquired to expand our park inventory and provide park facilities for people throughout the city. But open, sp so open space conservation is a little different. That's preserving property, perhaps to uh, address stormwater needs, to store stormwater, or just to prevent development, prevent a, uh, or protect, excuse me, protect a ecological landscape that might be valuable. An example of that is Broadcast Hill. That's part of the Blackland Prairie. In East Fort Worth, it's adjacent to the Tandy Hills nature area. And it, so that was the first acquisition that was done as part of the open space conservation program. This would put $15 million toward funding toward that effort as well. So facility improvements, and this includes community centers, police, fire, and public libraries, shown here distribution with the uh, council districts and then with the SMMAs and MMAs. Listed here, a total of 77 million. Library, we have one standalone library recommended in this bond program. That's up in North Fort Worth near Sundera Ranch. It's a very uh, rapidly growing area, a lot of people moving in there. Last year, I heard uh, we had over 3,000 people move in there last year, and that was during COVID. So we added that population. So again, that's an area where we need to add city services and facilities. So this would address that need for a library uh, in that area. Oh, wow, uh, this map also shows distribution of libraries throughout the rest of the city. These are existing facilities. So the recommended ones highlighted in yellow. The others are shown. Two fire stations, uh, Fire Station 37 in North Fort Worth, $8 million. That they, uh, the Fire Station 37 is currently in a temporary facility. It's been a temporary facility since 1998, so it's 23 years they've been in a temporary uh, building. It's time to get them a permanent home, and this funding would go toward uh, development of that uh, permanent structure. Fire Station 16 replacement, uh, this is the seventh busiest fire station, it's West Fort Worth. It is a 5,000 square foot facility. New facilities are 10,000 square feet, so it's about half of what's needed. It also is not, when it was built 57 years ago, they didn't take female firefighters into account, and it was just built for, or without any female changing rooms. So this funding would go toward addressing that need and development of a new uh, fire station. Two community centers. The first one, the Stop Six Hub, would be the replacement of Martin Luther King Jr. Community Center in East Fort Worth. The new community center, the Stop Six Hub, is located about a mile northwest of Martin Luther King Community Center. So when the new one's built, the existing Martin Luther King Community Center would be torn down, and the, that site then would be restored as parkland, as a neighborhood park. Um, so the new center is gonna be bigger than our standard uh, community center, 28,000 square feet, because it's going to include a library, 
It will include um, space for social services in addition to those standard community park facilities like gyms and multi-purpose rooms, and that sort of thing. Second, Fire Station Community Center. Uh, this was recommended and considered back in 2018. Um, there was a need then. It was really between Fire Station Community Center and Diamond Hill. Both were very close. Uh, we moved forward with, with Diamond Hill Community Center, of which we're going to start construction next month. Um, fire Station Community Center will be, and not to confuse us with the fire station, the community center is actually housed in an old fire station. We have to keep part of that historic structure, but this would be to replace the existing facility and expand it to 20,000 square feet. The Northwest Patrol, so for the police officers in the back, if you're in Northwest, I guess, this will be a new precinct facility for the Northwest Patrol. Uh, they're currently in a, a leased facility that has a cost of over 150000 a year. So getting uh, the police in a city-owned facility, this would be built on 60 acres of city-owned land, so it would be in a, in a city-owned facility. And that's one of the goals of the city is to move staff out of leased facilities into um, city-owned facilities. So that was a quick review of the projects. The uh, steps going forward, we're currently in these public meetings. Uh, we, like I mentioned, we kicked these off back in July at those citywide open houses, and now we're doing these district uh, town hall meetings. The, uh, following that, we'll, in October, we'll present the public input we've received to the, and, a, um, and the list of projects to the city council, get feedback from city council. City council will then vote to call for the election in January or February of 2022. Following that, there'll be a series of public education meetings to get the word out about this bond election and what projects are included on that ballot. And that election then is on Saturday, May 7th, 2022. So, any questions? All right. Michelle, do you, uh, all right. <laughs> Next, we'll have a presentation on the TPW projects that are in District 2. All right, good evening. I'm Lauren Preer. I'm the Assistant Director for Capital Delivery. Uh, tonight, we'll talk a little bit about all the projects we have going on within TPW, uh, most notably our arterial projects, our mobility inter intersection projects, our neighborhood streets. We'll also cover uh, some of the stormwater projects we have going on, as well as some general transportation management updates. So we'll start off with our arterials. Oh, here, let me go back. So in our arterials category, we had over 60 arterial, arterial projects that were weighted against the bonds project prioritization criteria of congestion, capital replacement needs, crash data, uh, equity, public health and safety concerns, our project collaboration opportunities, we mentioned Tarrant County, as well as economic development opportunities. So right now we have three active or planned arterial projects within Council District 2. Uh, so those are Cantrell Sansom, uh, Crumble Marine Creek, and WJ Boaz. Uh, to date, we've been able to match about $78.4 million from our 2022 bond arterial project funds with the Tarrant County Bond Fund. And an, and an additional $200 million in leveraging opportunities still remains with Tarrant County. So Cromwell Marine Creek and W.J. Boaz are proposed in our 2022 bond program and will receive up to 50% of their project funds from the Tarrant County bond program. So the Cantrell Sansom Road Project will connect I-35 southbound service road under construction by TxDOT to the Mark IV Parkway. So this project is funded by transportation impact fees assessed to developers. Right now, we're acquiring right-of-way with construction scheduled for the fall of 22. The existing asphalt lanes will also be re reconstructed in concrete uh, during construction of the two new lanes. So Cromwell Marine Creek, this project started out in the 2018 bond program as a $12 million project for intersection improvements only, as well as the repaving of the current uh, roadway. So this project is now one of our largest and most impactful bond projects. The project scope was changed by MNC in June of 2020. 
to acquire right away for the full MTP cross section of six lanes and we're building four lanes of those six lanes with a revised estimated cost of about $37 million. So the additional $25 million needed for this project will come from both the 2022 bond program as well as the Tarrant County bond. We're currently in redesign for the four lanes which started in the summer of 2020 and is currently at 60% complete with construction anticipated to begin in the fall of 2022. W.J. Boaz from Boat Club Road to Elkins School Road is located in both Council District 2 and 7. Tarrant County has committed to funding about $10.7 million of this project with their bond program. So this project will also include a side path, also known as a shared use path. Uh, we're anticipating a 2025 construction start date due to the complex design to, to flatten the curve at the intersection as much as possible along with significant right-of-way acquisition needs and franchi franchise utility relocations. So Meacham is a proposed five-lane undivided thoroughfare. This project is at the tail end of our proposed 2022 bond arterial project list and may be waitlisted until the 2026 bond. So our mobility and intersection projects. So construction for the interim roundabout at W.J. Boaz and Bowman Roberts started on August 12th of this year. This project is an interim measure using residual 2014 bond funds to improve the safety and operation of the intersection by slowing the vehicular speeds and increasing sight distance at the intersection. So this project also includes sidewalks. So construction began this July for the traffic signal at North Main and East Long Avenue. Intersection modifications will improve congestion and reduce the queuing lengths on all four approaches uh, with new cabinets and hardware to be installed. ADA ramps will also be upgraded to meet legal requirements. So construction is currently 30% complete and scheduled for completion in January. So the project at Northwest Loop 820 and Marine Creek Parkway uh, is broken down into two phases based on the coordination and approvals required from TxDOT. Phase one is at 90% design and scheduled for construction next summer. Phase one includes the installation of an eastbound U-turn uh, lane and the adjacent trail pass. Drivers should see a substantial reduction in delay at this intersection with the phase one change. Phase two is a federally funded and within the text dot right away. This project is anticipated to begin construction in the spring of 2024. So traffic signal improvements at East Long Avenue and Dean Road are substantially complete. Intersection improvements at West Long and Angle Avenue are advertising for construction this month with construction scheduled to begin in February. Construction bids for sidewalk improvements within a quarter mile of Diamond Hill, W.J. Turner, and Bonnie Bray Elementary Schools will open on September 16th. Construction is scheduled to begin shortly in the new year. So W.J. Turner and Diamond Hill Elementary are, are obviously in Council District 2. Uh, Bonnie Bray Elementary is in Council District 4. So our neighborhood streets projects, the construction of Great Southwest Parkway from the 2018 bond is 75% complete and on schedule for an October completion. Uh, this really is an interesting project that may see, seem simple on the surface, but came with a lot of stormwater challenges, uh, arterial water line crossings, driveway access issues, as well as a subsurface petroleum pipeline. So our neighborhood street projects typically bundle multiple street segments into packages for biddability purposes. Uh, 10 street segments are part of this project. We're currently working to complete driveways on North Houston Street. So 
So stormwater management projects are funded separately through a stormwater utility fee uh, that property owners pay as a line item on their water bill uh, for developed properties. So the stormwater management's program mission is to protect people and property from harmful stormwater runoff with a focus on projects that pr protect life safety. Along those lines, the Loving Avenue project was completed this spring and mitigates hazardous road flooding, protecting the lives of drivers during heavy rain events and also mitigates area home flooding. The Greenfield Acres Drainage Improvements is a phased flood mitigation project that we've been working on for several years to mitigate home and property flooding. So phase one and two have been completed. Phase three is currently under construction. Phase four is expected to begin next summer and involve construction of a new storm, storm drain in the areas shown in yellow. The 28th Street at Decatur uh, HROM project is another high-priority life-saving uh, safety project that will reduce hazardous road overtopping from the Lebeau Channel at this crossing through channel improvements expected to begin next spring. So lastly, I wanted to mention that we'll be having some upcoming public engagement efforts to get community feedback on the next potential phases of Lebeau Flood Mitigation Concept Plan. Uh, the stormwater program has spent roughly $20 million to date implementing pieces of this plan over time and is evaluating the feasibility of another potential phase. So we'll be reaching out in the fall to get your public feedback to help us determine if an acceptable, effective, and affordable phase can be identified next. All right, just a quick summary of transportation management. So Vision Zero, City Council adopted a resolution in November 2019 that supports the development of a Vision Zero strategy to eliminate traffic fatalities and severe injuries. So in support of this effort, uh, Transportation and Public Works initiated a school zone site maintenance program in 2020 to ensure that the safety of our most vulnerable uh, roadway users is enhanced, especially as they walk to and from school. So the following schools received updated signs, refreshed pavement markings, and preventative maintenance on their flashing beacons. So the following sidewalks were repaired or installed in Council District 2 this past year. The following streets have received new pavement markings in Council District 2 this year. And in summary, over 155 streetlights have been upgraded to LED in Council District 2. Uh, over 33 knockdown poles have been reinstalled, three signals upgraded, and over 400 work orders closed. So that concludes my presentation. Uh, we do have project maps for the 2022 bond outside. We have plenty of staff here to talk with you about your individual project questions or just questions in general about TBW, but I'll open up the floor now. Uh, yes, ma'am? Yeah, I have a question about um, speed control uh, on the neighborhood street. Um, I understand that the city board is known for putting in speed bumps, but I there is certainly a speed cushions or uh, speed tables or something. What, what is the, the outlook on putting those in um, throughout the neighborhood streets? So I'm not the expert on that, but. I will encourage you to uh, listen to the council work session. I believe it's next Tuesday. We'll be having a presentation specifically on that topic. And the question was, um, uh, you know, how does TPW uh, mitigate and reduce speed in neighborhoods? Are speed bumps or speed tables an option? And I do believe that is the exact subject, subject of a, a presentation on Tuesday. Absolutely. All right, thank you all. Ms. Young, in, in answer to your question right there, 
the speed tables or speed cushions as you refer to them as being, that was brought up, I think, what, two, almost three years ago uh, by myself at council. And uh, TPW has been studying that and uh, hence we're gonna have an update on that at our next council meeting. Next, we're going to get a presentation on the proposed budget. Good evening, I'm Lorraine Coleman. Um, I'm with the Planning and Data Analytics Department. I'm budget manager. I'm here instead of um, my director who couldn't be here this evening. So some of you, this will be your third time hearing me. <laughs> At least with Bond, you got different folks every night, so. Um, but we're gonna talk tonight about, we're gonna walk through some of the property tax variables that impact our budget. Um, then we're gonna take a high level view of the overview of our budget and then talk about the next steps in the process. So I finally got to mark, watch Mark's only presentation he did and he gave away everything at the very beginning. So I'm gonna make you all wait till the end to know what the next steps are. So first of all, we're gonna talk about the property tax and assess value and the recommended tax rate and how these things work together. So as you can see from this chart, we, the city of Fort Worth has continued to enjoy growth over the last seven, eight years, and this actually continues on back as well. Um, and what you're looking at here is appraised value, which is market value. So the value of your house, if you were to sell it tomorrow, that's your market or appraised value. That's the top line. The, the bottom line is your net taxable value. So if you have a homestead exemption on that house, then that becomes your net taxable value. Um, and what we really wanna look at is those last two numbers, the 79 billion versus the 87 billion, because it's the change year over year that we've had from 21 going into 22. And so as you can see on this slide, in this current fiscal year, we had $79 billion of value, of net taxable value within the city of Fort Worth. Of that, $4.2 billion was a change in existing value. So that's a 5.3% increase in average over all existing value this year. Now, $3.2 billion of that is attributable to new growth, new houses, new hotels, new businesses, and that accounts for 4.1%, which gets us to the FY22 net taxable value of $87 billion. And this net taxable value is what we use to calculate our levy, our revenue, um, as we develop the budget, as we work through the whole process of the budget. And so that we take that net taxable value and from that we determine a tax rate. And this year we're recommending a tax rate of 0.7325, which is a reduction of a penny and a half off the current rate. And so what we do with that, and you saw this slide in Joel's um, presentation, but we allocate that tax rate out to various expenses. Now, if you go onto our website, and I've told quite a few folks this, you go onto the budgets page, you scroll down to the bottom and you're gonna see um, truth and taxation. You can look at our calculation seats that we have to submit to the state. And you're gonna see two rates that we, that we calculate formally. And those are the operations and maintenance, which is just what you think. It's the salaries, it's the, the maintenance of existing facilities and the programs that we offer throughout the city. And then debt, which pays for the bond programs in the past um, and those long-term projects and capital assets that we have. As a city, we further separate the operations and maintenance out into just operations, of, and of that we allocate 52 cents to those salaries, safety, maintenance um, operations type, and then we allocate also six and a half cents to what we call PAYGO, or um, cash-funded capital projects during the year to maintain street lights, and we'll have a list as we get further on. So that's how we allocate those tax dollars, the tax rate, and we'll look and see how that looks in dollars as well. 
So this slide shows the history um, since 2013 of our tax rate, and you'll see that beginning in 2017, we began to reduce that tax rate in response to the rising values. So, and over the years, you can see uh, we've lowered it quite a bit. Um, oops. The bottom portion of it shows you what we commit to the PAYGO, that cash-funded maintenance of the infrastructure, as well as to the debt service, and that we're maintaining, you know, we increased it over time and we're maintaining that commitment overall as well. So back to the taxable value. So we take that taxable value, we apply a tax rate, which is 73.25 cents per $100 of value to, S to get to our property tax revenue of $596 million in property tax revenue. So you can see that although our taxable value is up 9.4%, we were able to lower the tax rate one and a half cents, so that our property tax revenue shows an increase of 7%. And remember, 4.1% of that is attributable to new construction. So here's what this looks like in terms of dollars. We take that rate, and this is a comparison from the current year to the uh, recommended 22 budget. And you can see that for operation and maintenance, we're increasing $26 million. PAYGO, we're increasing $4 million. You see we've got a line on there, economic development. We were able this year to um, put aside a quarter of a cent for economic incentives as we go forward. And then, of course, debt increased $6.4 million as well. So this slide kind of shows you what those variables do. So this is for the city of Fort Worth tax rate only. Um, but the example is you have a house that has a taxable value of $200,000 this year. If you increase that value 5.3% on average, brings you to 210,000, so this changed your net taxable value. And of course, when you apply the tax rate in each year, in 2021, the current year, your taxes would be $1,495 or $4.10 a day. And in 22, it would be $1,543 or 4.23 4 cents per day, which is an increase of, what, 13 cents per day. Um, it's just one way to look at it. You can apply any type of time to this, um, but this is just to show that it's the increase for those various factors or the changes. And when you go back to the chart that shows how we allocate those dollars out of your $1,500, 1232 is going to go to operation and maintenance, which means $1,000 or $1,100 is going to go to the operations. 137 is going to that infrastructure, that pay-as-you-go um, allocation. And then $311 goes to the debt that we pay. So now we're going to move to the recommended budget. We're going to take a high-level view of what that looks like for this year and what it's going to take to fund the programs and functions of the city. So overall, for all departments, all funds, it's a $1.8 billion budget. And that includes a general fund, which houses your most of your um, services, your safety, your parks, your libraries, your code compliance. And that's general fund is 40% of that at $761 million. Your enterprise funds, which are your, your water and sewer, your solid waste, your storm water, those are 33% of the total, or $631 million. Our special revenue funds, which include CCPD, culture and tourism type funds, are another $171 million. Internal service funds, which are our fleet services, our risk management um, fund, is $138 million. Debt service is $128 million, and, and our fiduciary funds for our health trusts are another $30 million. So when you look at the general fund revenues, you can see by this, okay, hopefully you can see by this chart that approximately 80% 
of the general fund revenues are generated through taxes, and those are sales taxes and property taxes. And the remainder of the revenue generated in the, in the general fund is through other taxes, transfers in from departments for services rendered internally, um, charges for services, license and permits, those type of things. So this is just another view of, of the revenues comparing the current year to the 22 recommended budget. And you can see that at the bottom, it's about a $43 million change, or about 6% from 21 to 22. And this breaks it down by department. So these are all the departments that are funded through the general fund. And again, this is their current budget versus what will be adopted for, or recommended for 22. And if we didn't say, if you signed up outside, you will get a copy of this presentation. So you'll have these slides for further review. So of that 43 million we just increased, we talked about, the majority of that 40 million is, is um, for these main things. We have a pension contribution. We have collective bargaining for our fire staff, um, civil service staff. We have um, opening new facilities, which we do every year. We also have um, police and wage benefits, a pay for performance program for general employees, and economic development incentives. When we look at the enterprise funds at 631 million overall, you can see that water and sewer is the majority of that. We also have solid waste, stormwater, municipal airports and municipal parking. And the good news about those, their budgets, is there's no retail water sewer increases, there's no residential solid waste increases, no stormwater be increases, and no parking rate increases this year. Our special revenue funds, uh, the top one is CCPD, which is funded through a half penny of sales tax revenue at 92 million. We have the culture and tourism funds and our municipal golf fund is also in one of our special revenue funds. Um, these are, represent $173 million of the total budget. As part of our budget process, we also develop a five-year CIP capital improvement plan and in the red box is, will, is the recommended um, plan for FY22, which is $442 million, broken down into those specific plans. So PAYGO funding we talked about, which is our what we pay every year, it includes street maintenance, um, traffic system maintenance, neighborhood improvement strategies, your park maintenance, bridge, sidewalks, and street lighting. So this slide is just sort of a, a look at how the revenue impacts per capita. So the 2020 census, our new population number is 918,000. That was last year. We've grown since then. Um, but you know, in FY21, we have 870 million dollars in general fund revenue or in tax revenue, let me rephrase that. So that's about $946 a day, or a year, $2.59. For 22, that increases to $928 million in tax revenue, and it's about $1,010 a day, a year. Billions, millions, years, days. Um, so the next steps. We have a couple more of these town hall meetings, and I believe some of these they are recording, and so you can watch them again online, refer your friends to them. Also, we will be having a council budget work session tomorrow. Tune in, listen. Um, we will have the public hearing on the budget and the tax rate scheduled for September 14th at 7 p.m. at City Hall. And then we have the anticipated budget adoption on the 21st of September. Again, 7 p.m. City Hall. And those are the remaining dates of the town halls. So, any questions? Yes, sir? I wonder just to kind of check my math. Okay. See, I, I, from what I can see, it sounds like when you consider 
the rate of inflation and the growth of Fort Worth, that the increase seems to make sense. So if you consider that the budget is increasing 6%, which you already documented that 4% is attributed to new construction, then the remaining 2% seems to line up with inflation. So am I thinking that correctly in my head that you seem to be kind of in line with growth and inflation? Yes. But I just hear everybody's always talking about how everything keeps going up, but it's like, well, it seems like it makes sense. And I just wanted to make sure I understood it but so I could explain it to somebody else, but it does seem to make sense. Right. Okay, and the last topic that we're going to kind of go over briefly, and I thought maybe the best way to give an overview of this was to go to our webpage on redistricting. So as Council Member Flores mentioned, um, we will be going through deep redistricting and we will be adding two new council districts. And so while every 10 years when the census comes out, there usually is some redistricting done, this is especially important um, because we will be adding the two new council districts. So um, we have created a web page on the city's website, um, and you can get to it by fortworthtexas.gov redistricting. And in it, we have tried to put all of the information on redistricting in one place. One of the really important things that we want the community to help with is drawing maps to help us determine what we want those um, new districts to look like. And to do that, we have um, partnered with Esri, which is a software uh, provider, to um, have a software program where people can go in and create their own maps. So on our webpage, we have a link to the software. We also have um, information and links to videos that Esri has provided so that people can watch that and it will help them learn how to use the software. We have had some software training already in the community. Right now, the software is being updated with the new census information. And once that is ready, we're going to do another round of training sessions out in the districts. And those will start sometime after September 20th, because that's when we anticipate the software being updated. Um, we do have a video of our first training session, which is on the website. So if someone is interested in learning, they can watch the video that we have online and they can actually get a copy of the training material. If someone starts to do the training and they have problems, we have an email address that staff monitors that can um, answer any questions that they have and we can actually come out and do training sessions for your organization. We just did one this past week for 14 people with um, a sorority, um, so that we're, we're able to do that for other organizations. Another important thing that's going on right now is we're registering communities of interest. And the reason this is important is um, last year there was a task force on redistricting, and one of the things they wanted to do is to have communities of interest communities of interest able to self-identify and be protected meaning that they would remain in a council district if that was their preference so we have a registration form online that communities of interest can use and we will actually add that layer to the software and then those communities will be kept within one council district when the redistricting takes place we also have all of the information from our redistricting task force that took place, the criteria that they developed, and also all of the material and the presentations that happened at each of their meetings is available on the website um, for anyone to view. And we also have Redistricting 101, which is a presentation that tells um, all about redistricting and why it's important and why it's done on the local state and federal level. 
So I would encourage anybody who's interested in this to visit the website. I also have two handouts out in the front. One talks about the communities of interest and how people can register. And the other handout has an overview of all of the redistricting information and um, a link to the email address for questions, but also the website. And I'm available if anybody has any questions about redistricting afterwards. That's it. Any big questions? Oh, we are recording tonight's um, video and it will be made available. We are, we are also adding Spanish um, subtitles to the video and we will be sending that out and it will be posted on our YouTube channel. It usually takes about a day for us to add the presentations in and um, to add the Spanish subtitles, but that should be available at the latest, like early next week. And we'll send that out. If you provide your email address, we'll send out a link. All right, thank you, Michelle. And also, just uh, that we make sure that we avail ourselves of our uh, Fort Worth police officers. Uh, Chief Aldridge, uh, if you wanted to field any questions, if anyone has any questions for uh, PD, they can answer them right now. So uh, Chief Aldridge is available you know, as well. Do we have any questions for uh, PD or anything related to uh, policing? All right. Well, if anyone has any questions after the meeting, I think the officers uh, can stick around and uh, field those. So thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Uh, appreciate your interest in how your city operates. We endeavor uh, to be as transparent as possible and to give you the information that you need so that you can understand what your elected officials and what your city staff do for you every day. Thank you very much.